Hi, I'm Rebecca, and welcome back to Quick Book Looks. We are going to be reading The Eight by Catherine Neville today. Uh, it is an excellent book of mystery and intrigue. It is set in two different time periods, 1972 and 1790. Uh, it travels back and forth between them and involves a lot of chess. So if you're interested in that, uh, this would be a good book to check out. Also, if you're a fan of the Da Vinci Code, um, this would be a really good book to read and is one of my favorites. I've reread this multiple times. All right, chapter one, the defense. Characters tend to be either for or against the quest. If they assist it, they are idolized as simply gallant or pure. If they obstruct it, they are characterized as simply villainous or cowardly. Hence, every typical character tends to have his moral opposite confronting him like black and white pieces of a chess game. Ad Anatomy of Criticism, Northrop Fry, Montglaim Abbey, France, Spring 1790. A flock of nuns crossed the road, their crisp wimples fluttering about their heads like wings of a large sea birds. As they floated through the large stone gate of the town, chickens and geese scurried out of the path, flapping and splashing through the mud puddles. The nuns moved through the darkening mist that enveloped the valley each morning and in silent pairs headed towards the sound of the deep bell that rang out from the hills above them. They called that spring La Pretemps Sanglet, the bloody spring. The cherry trees had blossomed early that year, long before the snows had melted from the high mountain peaks. Their fragile branches bent down to earth with the weight of the wet red blossoms. Some said it was a good omen that they had bloomed so soon, a symbol of rebirth after a long and brutal winter. But then the cold rains had come and frozen the blossoms of the bough, leaving the valley buried thick in red blossoms stained with brown streaks of frost, like a wound congealed with dried blood, and this was said to be another kind of sign. High above the valley, the Abbey of Montglain rose like an enormous outcropping of rock from the crest of the mountain. The fortress-like structure had remained untouched by the outside world for nearly a thousand years. It was constructed of six or seven layers of wall built on one on top of the other. As the original stone eroded over the centuries, new walls were laid outside of the old ones with flying buttresses. The result was a brooding architectural melange whose very appearance fed the rumors of the place. The abbey was the oldest church structure standing intact in France, and it bore an ancient curse that was soon to be reawakened. As the dark-throated bell rang out across the valley, the remaining nuns looked up from their labors one by one, put aside their rakes and hoes, and passed down through the long, symmetrical rows of cherry trees to climb the precipitous road to the abbey. At the end of the long procession, two young novices, Valentine and Muriel, Trailed arm in arm, picking their way with muddy boots, they had made an odd compliment to the orderly line of nuns. The tall red-haired Marielle, with her long legs and broad shoulders, looked more like a healthy farm girl than a nun. She wore a heavy butcher's apron over her habit, and red curls strayed from beneath her wimple. Beside her, Valentine seemed fragile, though she was nearly as tall. Her pale skin seemed translucent, its fairness accentuated by the cascade of white blonde hair that tumbled about her shoulders. She had stuffed her wimple into the pocket of her habit, and she walked reluctantly beside Muriel, pick, picking her boots in the mud. The two young women, the youngest nuns at the abbey, were cousins uh, on their mother's side, both orphaned at the early age by a dreadful plague that had ravaged France. The aging Count de Remy, Valentine's grandfather, had commended them into the hands of the church upon his death, leaving the sizable balance of his estate to ensure their care. The circumstances of their upbringing had formed an inseparable bond between the two, who were both bursting with the unrestrained, abundant gaiety of youth. The abbess often heard the older nuns complain that the behavior was unbecoming to the cloistered life, but she understood that it was better to curb youthful spirits than to try and quench them. Then, too, the abbess felt a certain partiality to the orphan cousins, a feeling unusual both to her personality and her station. The older nuns would have been surprised to learn that the abbess herself had sustained from early childhood such a bosom friendship with a woman who had been separated from her by many years and many thousands of miles. Now on the steep trail, Mary was tucking some unruly wisp of red hair back under her wimple and tugging her cousin's arm as she tried to lecture her on the sin of tardiness. If you keep on dwaddling, the Reverend Mother will give us a penance again, she said. Valentine broke loose and twirled around in a circle. 
The earth is drowning in spring, she cried, swinging her arms about and nearly toppling over the edge of the cliff. Muriel hauled her up along the treacherous incline. Why must we be shut up in that stuffy abbey when everything out of doors is bursting with life? Because we are nuns, said Muriel with pursed lips, stepping up her pace, her hand firmly on Valentine's arm. And it is our duty to pray for mankind. But the warm mist rising from the valley floor brought with its fragrance so heavy that it saturated everything with the aroma of cherry blossoms. Muriel tried not to notice the stirrings that caused this caused in her own body. We are not yet nuns, thank God, said Valentine. We are only novices until we have taken our vows. It's not too late to be saved. I've heard the older nuns whispering that there are soldiers roaming about in France, looting all of the monasteries of their treasures, rounding up the priests and marching them off to Paris. Perhaps some soldiers will come here and march me off to Paris too and take me to the opera each night and drink champagne from my shoe. Soldiers are not always so very charming as you seem to think, observed Muriel. After all, their business is killing people, not taking them to the opera. That's not all they do, said Valentine, her voice dropping to a mysterious whisper. They had reached the top of the hill where the road flattened out and widened considerably. Here was cobbled with flat paving stones and resembled the broad thoroughfares one found in a large town. On either side of the road, huge cypress had been planted, rising above the sea of cherry orchards. They looked formal and forbidding and like Abbey itself, strangely out of place. I have heard, Valentine whispered in her cousin's ear, that the soldiers do dreadful things to nuns. If a soldier should come upon a nun in the woods, for example, he immediately takes the thing out of his pants and he puts it into the nun and stirs it about. And then when he finishes, the nun has a baby. What blasphemy, cried Muriel, pulling away from Valentine and trying to suppress the smile hovering about her lips. You are entirely too saucy to be a nun, I think. Exactly what I've been saying all along, Valentine admitted. I would far rather be the bride of a soldier than the bride of Christ. As the two cousins approached the abbey, they could see the four double rows of cypresses planted at each entrance to form the sign of the crucifix. The trees closed in about them as they scurried along through the blackening mist. They passed through the abbey gates and crossed the large courtyard. As they approached the high wooden door to the main enclave, the bell continued to ring, like a death knell cutting through the thick mist. Each paused before the doors to scrape mud from her boots, crossed herself quickly, and passed through the high portal. Neither glanced up at the inscription carved in crude Frankish letters in the stone arch above the portal, but each knew what it said as if the words were engraved upon her heart. Cursed be he who brings these walls to earth, the king is checkered by the hand of God alone. Beneath the inscription, the name was carved in large block letters, Carolus Magnus. He it was who was architect both of the building and the curse placed upon who would destroy it. The greater ruler of the Frankish Empire over a thousand years earlier, he was known to all in France as Charlemagne. The interior walls of the abbey were dark, cold, and wet with moss. From the inner sanctum, one could hear the whispered voices of the novitiates praying to, and the soft clicking of their rosaries counting off the Aves, Glorias, and Paternosters. Valentine and Muriel hurried through the chapel as the last of the novices were genuflecting and followed the trail of whispers to the small door behind the altar where the Reverend Mother study was located. An older nun was hastily shooing the last of the stragglers inside. Valentine and Muriel glanced at each other and, and passed within. It was strange to be called to the abbess's study in this manner. Few nuns had ever been there at all, and then usually for disciplinary action. Valentine, who was always being disciplined, had been there often enough, but the Abbey Bell was used to convene all the nuns. Surely they would not all be called at once to the Reverend Mother's study. As they entered the large, low ceiling room, Valentine and Muriel saw that all the nuns in the Abbey were indeed there, more than 50 of them, seated on rows of hard wooden benches that had been set up facing the abbess's writing desk. They whispered among themselves. Clearly, everyone thought it was a strange circumstance. And the faces that looked up at the two young cousins entered seemed frightened. The cousins took their place in the last row of benches. Valentine clasped Muriel's hand. What does it mean? She whispered. It bodes ill, I think, replied Muriel, also in a whisper. The Reverend Mother looks grave, and there are two women here whom I have never seen. At the end of the long room, behind a massive desk of polished cherry wood, stood the abbess, wrinkled and leathery as an old parchment, but still exuding the power of her tremendous office. There was a timeless quality in her bearing that suggested she had long ago made peace with her own soul, but today she looked more serious than the nuns had ever seen her. Two strangers, both large-boned young women with big hands, loomed at either side of her like avenging angels. 
One had pale skin, dark hair, and luminous eyes, while the other bore a strong resemblance resemblance to Muriel with a creamy complexion and chestnut hair only slightly darker than Muriel's auburn locks. Though both had the bearing of nuns, they were not wearing habits but plain gray traveling clothes of nondescript nature. The abbess waited until all the nuns were seated and, and the door had been closed. When the room was completely silent, she began to speak in the voice that always reminded Valentine of a dry leaf being crumbled. My daughters, said the abbess, folding her hands before her. For nearly 1,000 years, the Order of Montglain has stood upon this rock, doing our duty to mankind and serving God. Though we are cloistered from the world, we hear the rumblings of the world's unrest. Here in our small corner, we have received unfortunate tidings of late that may change the security we've enjoyed for so long. The two women, the two women who stand beside me are bearers of those tidings. I introduce Sister Alexandrine de Forbin. She motioned to the dark-haired woman and Marie-Charlotte de Corday, who together direct the Abbe Oxname at Caen in the northern provinces. They have traveled the length of France in disguise, an arduous journey to bring us a warning. I therefore bid you hark unto what they have to say. It is of gravest importance to us all. The abbess took her seat, and the woman who had been introduced as Alexandrine de Forbin cleared her throat and spoke in a low voice so that the nuns had to strain to hear her but her words were clear. My sisters and God, she began, the tale we have to tell is not for the faint-hearted. There are those among us who came to Christ hoping to save mankind. There are those who came hoping to escape from the world, and there are those who came against their will, feeling no call whatsoever. At this, she turned her dark, luminous eyes directly upon Valentine, who blushed to the very roots of her pale blonde hair. Regardless what you thought your purpose was, it has changed as of today. In our journey, Sister Charlotte, and I have passed the length of France through Paris in each village in between. We have seen not only hunger, but starvation. People are riding in the streets for bread. There is butchery, women carrying severed heads on pikes through the streets. There is rape and worse. Small children are murdered. People are tortured in public squares and torn to pieces by angry mobs. The nuns were no longer quiet. Their voices rose in alarm as Alexandrine continued her bloody account. Muriel thought it was odd that a woman of God could recount such a tale without blanching. Indeed, the speaker had not once altered her low, calm tone, nor had she, nor had her voice quavered in the telling. <clears throat> Muriel glanced at Valentine, whose eyes were large and round with fascination. Alexandrine de Forbin waited until the room had quieted a bit, then continued. It is now April. Last October, the king and queen were kidnapped from Versailles by an angry mob and forced to return to the Tuileries at Paris, where they were imprisoned. The king was made to sign a document, the Declarations of the Rights of Man, proclaiming the equality of all men. The National Assembly, in effect, now controls the government. The king is powerless to intervene. Our country is beyond revolution. We are in a state of anarchy. To make matters worse, the assembly has discovered there is no gold in the state te treasury. The king has bankrupted the state. In Paris, it is believed that he will not live out the year. A shock ran through the rows of seated nuns, and there was an agitated whispering throughout the room. Mariel squeezed Valentine's hand gently as they both stared at the speaker. The women in this room had never heard such thoughts expressed out loud, and they could not conceive such things as real. Torture, anarchy, regicide. How was it possible? The abbess wrapped her hands flat upon the table to call for order, and the nuns fell silent. Now Alexandrine took her seat, and Sister Charlotte stood alone at the table. Her voice was strong and forceful. In the assembly, there is a man of great evil. He is hungry for power, though he calls himself a member of the clergy. This man is the Bishop of Atun. Within the Church of Rome, it is believed that he is the devil incarnate. It is claimed he was born with a cloven hoof, the mark of the devil, that he drinks the blood of small children to appear young, that he celebrates the Black Mass. In October, this bishop proposed to the assembly that the state confiscate all church property. On November 2nd, his bill of seizure was defended before the assembly by the great statesman Maribo, and it passed. On February 13th, the confiscation began. Any clergy who resisted were arrested and jailed. And on February 16th, the bishop of Attune was elected president of the assembly. Nothing can stop him now. The nuns were in a state of extreme agitation, their voices raised in fearful exclamations and protests, but Charlotte's voice carried above all. Long before the bill of seizure, the Bishop of Attune had made inquiries into the location of the church's wealth in France. 
Though, though the bill specifies that priests are to fall first and nuns to be spared, we know the bishop has cast his eyes upon Monk Lane Abbey. It is around Monk Lane that many of his inquiries have centered. This we have hastened here to tell you. The treasure of Monk Lane must not fall into his hands. The abbess stood and placed her hand upon the strong shoulders of Charlotte Corday. She looked out over the row of black-clad nuns, their stiff, starch hats moving like a sea thick with wild seagulls beneath her, and she smiled. This was her flock, which she had shepherded for so long and which she might not see again in her lifetime once she had revealed what she now must tell. Now you know as much of our situation as I, said the abbess, though I have known for many months of our plight, I did not wish to alarm you until I had chosen a path. In their journey responding to my call, our sisters from Cain have confirmed my worst fears. The nuns had now fallen into silence like a hush of death. Not a sound could be heard, but the voice of the abbess. I am an old woman who will perhaps be called to God sooner than she imagines. The vows I took when I entered the service of the convent were not only vows to Christ. Nearly 40 years ago, upon becoming abbess of Monk Lane, I vowed to keep a secret, to preserve it with my life if necessary. Now the time has come for me to keep that vow, but in doing so, I must share some of the secret with each of you and vow you to secrecy in return. My story is long and you have and you must have patience if I am slow in telling. When I have finished, you will know why each of us must do what must be done. The abbess paused to take a sip of water from a silver chalice that sat before her on the table. Then she resumed. Today is the fourth day of April, Anno Domini 1790. My story begins on another fourth of April many years ago. The tale was told me by my predecessors as it was told by each abbess to her successor on the event of her initiation. For as many years as this abbey has stood, and now I tell it to you. The Abbess's Tale On the 4th of April in the year 782, a wondrous festival was held at the Oriental Palace of Aachen to honor the 40th birthday of the great King Charlemagne. He had called forth all the nobles of his empire. The central court, with its mosaic dome and tiered circular staircase and balconies, was filled with imported palms and festooned with flower garlands. Harps and lutes were played in the large hall amid gold and silver lanterns. The courtiers, decked in purple, crimson, and gold, moved through a fairyland of jugglers, jesters, and puppet shows. Wild bears, lions, giraffes, and cages of doves were brought into the courtyard. All was merriment for weeks in anticipation of the king's birthday. The pinnacle of the festival was the day itself. On the morning of this day, the king arrived in the main courtyard, surrounded by his 18 children, his queen, and his favorite courtiers. Charlemagne was exceedingly tall with the lean grace of a horseman and swimmer. His skin was tan, his hair and mustache streaked blonde with the sun. He looked every inch the warrior and ruler of the largest kingdom in the world. Dressed in a simple woolen tunic with clothes fitted coat of marten skins and wearing his ever-present sword, he passed through the court greeting each of his subjects and bidding them partake of the lavish refreshments that were placed on groaning boards about the hall. The king had prepared a special treat for this day, a master of battle strategy. He had special fondness for one game, known as the game of war, the game of kings. It was the game of chess. On this, his 40th birthday, Charlemagne proposed to, to play against the best chess player in his kingdom, a soldier known as Garin the Frank. Garin entered the courtyard with blaring trumpets. Acrobats bounced before him. Young women strewn palm fronds and rose petals in his path. Garin was a slender, pale young man with serious countenance and gray eyes, a soldier in the Western Army. He knelt when the king rose to greet him. The chess service was borne into the great hall on the shoulders of eight black servants dressed in Moorish livery. His men and the chess board they carried aloft had been sent as gifts of Ibn al-Arabi, the Muslim governor of Barcelona, and thanks for the king's aid against the Pyrenees, Basques, four years earlier. It was during retreat from this famous battle at the Roncesvalles Pass in Navarre that the king's beloved soldier, Heruland, had been killed, hero of the Chanson de Roland. As a result of this unhappy association, the king had never played upon the chess service, nor brought it before his people. The court marveled at the magnificent chess service as it was set upon a table in the courtyard. Though made by Ar Arabic master craftsmen, the pieces bore traces of their Indian and Persian ancestry. For some believed this game existed in India over 400 years before the birth of Christ and came to Arabia through Persia during the 
Arabic conquest of the country in 640 AD. The board wrought entirely of silver and gold measured a full meter on each side. The pieces of filigree precious metals were studded with rubies, sapphires, diamonds, and emeralds, uncut but smoothly polished, some the size of quail eggs. Flashing and sparkling in the lamplight of the courtyard, they seemed to glow with the inner light that hypnotized the beholder. The piece called Shah, or King, was 15 centimeters high and depicted a crowned man riding on the back of an elephant. The queen, or Ferez, was seated within a covered sedan chair embroidered with jewels. The bishops were elephants with saddles encrusted in rare gems. The knights were wild Arabian steeds. The rooks, or castles, were called Ruhuk, the Arabic word for chariot. These were large camels with tower-like chairs upon their backs. The pawns or peons, as we call them now, were humble foot soldiers, seven centimeters high, with small jewels for eyes and gems flecking the hilts of their swords. Charlemagne and Garin approached the board from either side. Then the king, raising his hand aloft, spoke words that astounded those to the court who knew him well. I propose a wager, he said in a strange voice. Charles is not a man for wagers. The courtiers glanced at one another uneasily. Should my soldier Garin win a game of me, I bestow upon him that portion of my kingdom from Aachen to the Basque Pyrenees and the hand of my eldest daughter in marriage. Should he lose, he will be beheaded in the same courtyard at dawn. The court was in commotion. It was known that the king so loved his daughters that he had begged them never to marry during his lifetime. The king's dearest friend, the Duke of Burgundy, seized him by the arm and drew him aside. What manner of wager is this, he whispered. You have proposed a wager befitting a sodist barbarian. Charles seated himself at the table. He appeared to be in a trance-like state. The duke was mystified. Garam himself was confused. He looked into the duke's eyes and then, without a word, took his place at the board, accepting the wager. The pieces were selected, and as luck would have it, Garam chose white, giving him the advantage of the first move. The game began. Perhaps it was the tension of the situation, but it appeared as the game progressed that the two players moved their pieces with a force and precision that transcended a mere game, as if another, an invisible hand, hovered above the board. At times, it even seemed as if the very pieces carried out the moves of their own accord. The players themselves were silent and pale, and the courtiers hovered about them like ghosts. After nearly one hour of play, the Duke of Burgundy observed that the king was acting strangely. His brow was furrowed, and he seemed inattentive and distractive. Garin, too, was possessed by an unusual restlessness, his movements quick and jerking, his forehead beaded in cold sweat. The eye of the two men were fixed upon the board as if they could not look away. Suddenly, Charles leaped to his feet with a cry, upsetting the board and knocking all of the pieces to the floor. The courtiers pushed back to open the circle. The king had flown into a black and hor horrible rage, tearing at his hair and beating his chest like a wild beast. Garin and the Duke of Burgundy rushed to his side, but he knocked them away. It required six nobles to restrain the king. When at last he was subdued, it looked, he looked about in bewilderment as if he had just awakened from a long sleep. My lord, said Garin softly, picking up one of the pieces from the floor and handing it to the king. Perhaps we should withdraw from this game. The pieces are all in disarray, and I cannot recall a single move that was made. Sire, I fear this Moorish trust service. I believe it's possessed by an evil force that compels you to make a wager upon my life. Charlemagne rested upon a chair, put one hand wearily to his forehead, but did not speak. Garin, said the Duke of Burgundy cautiously, you know that the king does not believe in superstition of this sort, thinking them pagan and barbaric. He has forbidden necromancy and divination at the court. Charlemagne interrupted, but his voice was weak, as if from strenuous ex exhaustion. <clears throat> How can I bring the Christian enlightenment to Europe when soldiers in my own army believe in witchcraft? This magic has been practiced in Arabia and throughout the East from the beginning of time, Garen replied. I do not believe in it, nor do I understand it. But Garen bent over the king and looked into his eyes. You felt it too. I was consumed by the rage of fire, Charlemagne admitted. I could not control myself. I felt as one feels upon the morn of battle just as the troops are charging into the fray. I cannot explain it. But all things of heaven and earth have a reason, said a voice from behind the soldiers of Garen. He turned and there stood a black moor, one of the eight who had borne the chest service into the room. The king nodded for the moor to continue. From our water or birthplace come an ancient people called the Bwadi, the dwellers in the desert. Among these people, the blood wager is considered the most honorable. It is said that only the blood wager will remove the hab, 
the black drop in the human heart, which the arch archangel Gabriel removed from the breast of Muhammad. Your Highness has made a blood wager over the board, a wager upon a man's life, the highest form of justice. Muhammad says, kingdom endureth with kafir, infidelity to all Islam, but kingdom endureth not with zulm, which is injustice. A wager of blood is always a wager of evil, replied Charlemagne. Garin and the Duke of Burgundy looked at the king in surprise, for had he not himself proposed such a wager only an hour before? No, said the Moors stubbornly, though the blood wager can attain Gutha, the earthly oasis, which is paradise. If one makes such a wager of the board of Chatrange, it is the Chatrange itself that carries out the Sar. Chatrange is the name that the Moors give to the game of chess, my lord, said Garin. And what is Sar? asked Charlemagne, rising slowly to his feet. He towered over everyone around him. It is revenge, cried the Moor without expression. He bowed and stepped back from the king. We will play again, the king announced. This time there will be no wagers. We play for love of a simple game. There is nothing to these foolish superstitions invented by barbarians and children. The courtiers began to set up the board again. There were murmurs of relief coursing through the room. Charles turned to the Duke of Burgundy and took his arm. Did I really make such a wager, he asked softly. The duke looked at him in surprise. Why, yes, my lord, he said. Do you not remember it? No, the king replied sadly. Charlemagne and Ger Garin sat down to play again. After a remarkable battle, Garin emerged victorious. The king awarded him the property of Montglain and the Basque Pyr Pyrenees and the title of Garin de Montglain. So pleased was the king with Garin's masterful command of chess that he offered to build him a fortress to protect the territory he had won. After many years, the king sent Garin the special gift of the marvelous chess service upon which they had played their famous game. It was called ever after the Montglain service. That is the story of Montglain Abbey, the abbess said, concluding her tale. She looked across the sea of silent nuns. For after many years, when Garin de Montglain lay ill and dying, he bequeathed to the church the property of Montglain, the fortress which had become our abbey, and also the famous chess set called the Montglain service. The abbess paused a moment as if uncertain whether to proceed. At last, she spoke again. But Garin had always believed that there was a terrible con curse connected with the Montglain service. Long before it passed into his hands, he had heard rumors of evils associated with it. It was said that Charlotte, Charlemagne's own nephew had been murdered during a game played upon this very board. There were strange stories of bloodshed and violence, even of wars in which this service has played a part. The eight black Moors who had first conveyed the service from Barcelona into Charlemagne's keeping had begged to accompany the pieces when they passed over to Montglain, and so the king had permitted. Soon Garin learned that mysterious night ceremonies were being conducted within the fortress, rituals in which he felt certain the Moors had been involved. Garin grew to fear his prize as if it were a tool of the devil. He had the service buried within the fortress and asked Charlemagne to place a curse upon the wall to guard against it ever being removed. The king behaved as though it were a jest, but he complied with Garin's wishes in his own fashion, and thus we find the inscription above our door today. The abbess stopped and looked weak and pale, reached for the chair behind her. Alexandrine stood and helped the abbess to her seat. And what became of the Montglain service, Reverend Mother? asked one of the older nuns who was seated in the front row. The abbess smiled. I have told you already that our lives are in great danger if we remain in this abbey. I have told you that the soldiers of France seek to confiscate the treasures of the church and are in fact abroad in that mission even now. I have told you further that a treasure of great value and perhaps great evil was once buried within the walls of this abbey. So it should come as no surprise to you if I reveal that the secret I have sworn to hold in my bosom when I first took this office was the secret of the Montblain service. It is still buried within the walls in each floor of this room, and I alone know the precise location of each piece. It is our mission, my daughters, to remove this tool of evil, to scatter it as far and wide as possible, that it may never again be assembled into the hands of one seeking power. For it contains a force that trans transcends the laws of nature and the understanding of man. But even had we time to destroy those pieces or to debase them beyond recognition, I would not choose that path. Something with so great a power may also be used as an instrument of good. That is why I am sworn not only to keep the Montglain service hidden, but to protect it. Perhaps one day when history permits it, we shall reassemble the pieces and reveal their dark mystery. Although the abbess knew the precise location of each piece, it required the effort of every nun in the abbey for nearly two weeks before the Montglain service was exhumed and the pieces cleaned and polished. It required four nuns to lift the board loose from the stone floor. 
When it had been cleared, it was found to contain strange symbols that had been cut or embossed into each square. Similar symbols had been carved into the bottom of each chest piece. As also, there was a cloth that had been kept in a large metal box. The corners of the box had been sealed with a waxy substance, no doubt to prevent mildew. The cloth was as midnight blue velvet and heavily embroidered with gold thread and jewels and signs that were re resembled the zodiac. In the center of the cloth were two swirled, snake-like figures twined together to form the number eight. The abbess believed that this cloth had been used to cover the Montglain service so that it would not be damaged when transported. Near the end of the second week, the abbess told the nuns to prepare themselves for travel. She would instruct each in private regarding where she would be sent so that none of the nuns would know the location of the others. This would reduce the risk of each. As the Montglain service contained few, fewer pieces than the number of nuns at the abbey, no one but the abbess would know which of the sisters had carried away a portion of the service and which had not. When Valentine and Mariel were called into the study, the abbess was seated behind her massive writing desk and bade them take a seat opposite her. There on the desk lay the gleaming Montglaise service, partially draped with its embroidered cloth of midnight blue. The abbess laid aside her pen and looked up. Mariel and Valentine sat hand in hand, waiting nervously. Reverend Mother, Valentine blurted out, I want to know, I want you to know that I shall miss you very much now that I am to go away, and I realize that I have been a grievous burden to you. I wish I could have been a better nun and caused you less trouble. Valentine, said the abbess, smiling, as Muriel poked Valentine in the rib to silence her. What is it you wish to say? You fear that you will be separated from your cousin Muriel? Is that what is causing these belated apologies? Valentine stared in amazement, wondering how the abbess had read her thoughts. I shouldn't be concerned, continued the abbess. She handed Muriel a sheet of paper across the cherry wood desk. This is the name and address of the guardian who will be responsible for your care, and beneath it I've printed the traveling instructions I have arranged for both of you. Both, cried Valentine, barely able to remain in her seat. Oh, Reverend Mother, you have fulfilled my fondest wish. The abbess laughed. If you did not send if I did not send you together, Valentine, I feel certain you would single handedly find a way to destroy all the plans if carefully arranged, only to remain at your cousin's side. Besides, I have good reason to send you off together. Listen closely. Each nun at this abbey has been provided for. Those whose families accept them back will be sent to their homes. In some cases, I've found friends or remote relatives to provide them shelter. If they came to the abbey with dowries, I return those monies to them for their care and safekeeping. If no funds are available, I send a young woman to an abbey of good faith in another country. In all cases, travel and limit living expenses will be provided to ensure the well-being of my daughters. The abbess folded her hands and proceeded. But you are fortunate in several respects, Valentine, she said. Your grandfather has left you a generous income, which I earmark for both you and your cousin Muriel. In addition, though you have no family, you have a godfather who has accepted responsibility for you both. I have received writing assurances of his willingness to act in your behalf. This brings me to my second point, an issue of grave concern. Muriel had glanced at Valentine when the abbess spoke of the godfather, and now she looked down at the paper in her hand, where the abbess had printed in bold letters, Mr. Jacques-Louis David Painter, with an address beneath it in Paris. She had not known Valentine had a godfather. <clears throat> I realized, the abbess went on, when it is learned I've closed the abbey, there will be those in France who will be highly displeased. Many of us will be in danger, specifically for men such as the Bishop of Atun, who will wish to know what we have pried from the walls and carried away with us. You see, the traces of our activities cannot be completely covered. There may be women who are sought out and found. It may be necessary for them to flee. Because of this, I've selected eight of us, each of whom will have a piece of the service, but who will also serve as collection points, where the others may leave behind a piece if they must flee, or leave directions how to find it. Valentine, you will be one of the eight. I, said Valentine. She swallowed hard, for her throat had suddenly become very dry. But Reverend Mother, I am not, I do not. What you try to say is that you are scarcely a pillar of responsibility, said the abbess, smiling despite herself. I am aware of this, and I rely upon your sober cousin to assist me with that problem. She looked at Muriel, and the latter nodded her assent. I have selected the eight not only with regards for their capabilities, the abbess continued, but for their strategic placement. Your godfather, Monsieur David, lives in Paris, at the heart of the chessboard, which is in France. As a famous painter, he commands the respect and friendship of the nobility, but he is also a member of the assembly and is considered by some to be a fervent revolutionary. I believe him to be in a position to protect you both in case of need, and I have simply paid, and I have paid him amply for your care to provide him a motive to do so. 
The abbess peered across the table at the two young women. This is not a request, Valentine, she said sternly. Your sisters may be in trouble and you will be in a position to serve them. I've given your name and address to those, to some who have already departed for their home. You will go to Paris and do as I say. You have 15 years enough to know that there are things in life more crucial than the gratification of your immediate wishes. The abbess spoke harshly, but then her face softened as it always did when she looked at Valentine. Besides, Paris is not so bad a place of a sentence, she added. Valentine smiled back at the abbess. No, Reverend Mother, she agreed. There is the opera for one thing, and perhaps there will be parties and ladies. They say wear such beautiful gowns. Marielle punched Valentine in the ribs again. I mean, I humbly thank the Reverend Mother for placing such faith in her devout servant. At this, the abbess burst into a merry peal of laughter that belied her years. Very well, Valentine. You may both go and pack. You will leave tomorrow at dawn. Don't be tardy. Rising, the abbess lifted two heavy pieces from the board and handed them to the novices. Valentine and Muriel, in turn, kissed the abbess's ring with great care, conveyed their rare possessions to the door of the study. As they were about to depart, Muriel turned and spoke for the first time since they had entered the room. If I may ask Reverend Mother, she said, where will you be going? We should, be, we should like to think of you and send good wishes to you wherever you may be. I'm departing on a journey that I've longed to take for over 40 years, the abbess replied. I have a friend whom I've not visited since childhood. In those days, you know, at times, Valentine reminded me of very much of this childhood friend of mine. I remember her be as being so vibrant, so full of life. The abbess paused and Muriel thought that it was such a thing, that if such a thing could be said of so stately a person, the abbess looked wistful. Does your friend live in France, Reverend Mother? She asked. No, replied the abbess. She lives in Russia. The following morning, in the dim gray light, two women dressed in traveling clothes left the Abbey of Montglain and climbed into a wagon filled with hay. The wagon passed through the massive gates and started across the black bowls of the mountain. A light mist rose, obscuring them from view as they passed down into the far valley. They were frightened, and drawing their capes about themselves, felt thankful that they were on a mission of God as they re-entered the world from which they had so long been sheltered. But it was not God who watched them silently from the mountaintop as the wagon slowly descended into the darkness of the valley below. High on a snow-capped peak above the abbey sat a solitary rider astride a pale horse. He watched until the wagon had vanished into the dark mist. Then he turned his horse without a sound and rode away. That is the end of chapter one of The Eight by Catherine Neville. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it intrigued you a little bit. And that you had fun listening to me read. If you are interested in it, you can check it out from our library or on Libby. I hope you join me next week as I do another quick book look. Thank you.